Okay, in case you're wondering why I'm here in sports kit. It will hopefully make sense now. My wife was telling me this morning, I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. <laughs> anyway, that's how I roll. I, I like to embarrass my wife, my family. That's just part of my role. It's, it's the ministry I feel that the Lord is, has given me. But today, um, given that it's Comrades Sunday, it is an amazing opportunity to pull out one of um, the things that Paul talks about in the passage that we've been looking at the last little while. And that is running the race that's been set out for us to run. Now that's quite rich coming from me who's not running the comrades today and wouldn't dream of running the comrades. And the race that I feel the Lord has set me to run is the Saturday morning park run. <laughs> that's, that's about as far as it goes. No, I'm kidding. The, the most adventurous thing I think I've done has been the warrior race, which was an, an absolute joy. Um, but it doesn't come anywhere near the story that I'm going to share with you um, in a moment. So uh, I'll give you an update just now. I've got the live tracking going here with um, Mark. I can tell you right now, he's just come through Winston Park. And he is running at an average pace of 7 minutes 29 per kilometer. And he is just, that's 30 k's. He's just reached 30 k's. And not to be outdone, um, Magreta is on the 34k mark. And she is running at an average of 6 minutes 33 per kilometer. So, go for it. If you've been following Magreta's story, I know she's been having hip trouble. So she wasn't sure if she was going to even run today, or that she's going to finish. But she wanted to run until she can't run anymore. So, yeah, I'll let you know how they're doing at the end. Um, and it just fits so perfectly with the theme of, of today's message. But first, let's talk about a Danish guy. We know of a race that involves a 3.8 kilometer swim, a 180 kilometer cycle, and a 42 kilometer run, one after the other. The long distance triathlon that we know of as Ironman. I don't know if anyone here has done an Ironman. I think Andrew Russell has, um, but we, yeah, it's, it's not on my bucket list. Maybe it should be, but that's what we call the Ironman. And I'm going to rewind to 2017 where we meet the person we're going to talk about for a moment. Sitting at his computer, a young and desperately unhappy management consultant is trying unsuccessfully to write his quarter three report. Because all he can think about is football and training for his next Ironman. He's far away from the world of management consulting. There's these things he'd much rather be doing. He wants to be playing soccer, or he wants to be out training for his next Ironman. Very competitive young guy. His name is Anders Hoffman from Denmark. And Anders Hoffman takes a break from writing his quarterly report to start searching Ironman records. So he doesn't just want to do another Ironman. He wants to break an Ironman record of some kind. So he first of all searches how fast was the fastest Iron Man, seven hours something. And he realizes, okay, that's probably a little bit out of reach. So then he looks up, uh, looks up how many Iron Mans have been done in one year. And he discovers the Iron Cowboy, a guy in America who did 50 Iron Mans in 50 states, 50 consecutive days. I know, my response too, why? Anyway, you should see this guy, he's like, He's just skin and, bo and muscle, not skin and bone. He's just like this. Yeah. He, if, if, if Bill Tom was a person, that's him. <laughs> he finds another remarkable record where this guy, I forget his name, completed an Iron Man on each continent, except for Antarctica. Except for Antarctica. Except Antarctica starts going through Anders' mind. You can guess his next Google search. Has an Iron Man ever been completed on Antarctica? No, at the time. And in that moment, the idea for what became Project Iceman was born. And Anders, desperately unhappy in his role as a management consultant, start, started telling his friends, his family, anybody who would listen, what his 
grand ambition was. He was going to do the first Ironman on Antarctica. And he recalls a moment when he realized he was going to have to just go for it, even if he had nobody's support. He talks about this moment in the gym when the chairman of the company that he was working in told him, you will never be able to swim four kilometers in ice and water. And it was like a gun went off in his head. And that moment changed everything. He quit his job and he went full time in pursuit of this dream. And he says this, people will tell you what you can or cannot do without having the foundation of knowing what is possible. We don't think about what we're actually telling other people, but that has an impact. The chairman's words were like the spark that Anders needed to get going. And it changed his life forever. He quit his job, started chasing his dream full time, and this is the first video he posted to his YouTube channel after making that decision in 2018. I believe the ordinary can achieve the extraordinary. To prove this, I'm doing something that has never been done before, completing what I call an Iceman. In 2019, I'm going to swim 3.8 kilometers in ice water, bike 180 kilometers and run a marathon on Antarctica. People tell me it's impossible, but I want to show you that limitations are really only perceptions as to what we can achieve. My name is Anders, and I promise you, you won't regret following this crazy journey. That is the young Anders Hoffman about six years ago when he announced his journey to do the Iceman. And he took a leap off the well-worn path of, at least in his area of the world, management consulting, a secure paycheck, corporate job, and in its place, this wild, uncertain adventure that he really had no guarantee was going to succeed, funded it with his life savings, his family and friends, and the generosity of over 4,000 people from 72 countries got behind his vision. So how did things turn out? Well, on the screen, you will see the thumbnail for the wildly successful documentary that was released in December last year that tells the full story. It's already won some awards and you can watch it for free on YouTube. So uh, at the time of preparing today's message, it's already had over 2.3 million views on uh, YouTube. It's now on Apple TV and it's won a number of different awards around the world. So that is Anders Hoffman's story. But one of the remarkable things about it is that he continually deflects away from his own story to the reason why he's doing it. I mean, I thought he was doing it just to challenge himself, which he was. But he was actually doing it to prove to other people that the limitations that you impose on your life are not actually real. A lot of them are just your perceptions of what a normal life should look like or what you should be able to achieve. So he ends this story by challenging people. What is your ass man? What is the race that you are going to run? And then he realizes at the end of this that he hasn't actually pursued his own ass man. Now obviously he did the ass man, but his childhood dream was to play football for Denmark. But people told him, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never do that. You'll never do that. Just go to business school, which he did. Just go get a job in management consulting, which he did. And he let his dream die. So, if you go to his YouTube channel now, you will see videos of him training in Brazil to join the Danish football team for the 2026 World Cup. This guy is a lunatic. So he's training with like big names. I was watching him training with Roberto Carlos the other day, and he joined a, a, a friendly football match, and there, there was Kaká. I'm like, what? There's David Villa, and there's Roberto Carlos. If you're not sure, if you haven't ever watched football, these are famous people. And he scored the first goal in a, in a friendly, an international friendly um, that was raising money for something or other. Um, and you just see this blonde Danish dude running around the field. Like he is going all out for the dream that he has. So not only did he do the Iceman, but the challenge that he leaves with people at the end of it is, what is your Iceman? I watched this just before I went down to, um, to Cape Town for a few days to do some work with a client down there. And I, had, I got to run with two guys 
um, on the final morning in Betty's Bay. And the wind was just crazy. It wasn't a very comfortable morning to be out running. But we went running, and this is such a great conversation starter with people who may or may not share your faith. I just asked him, I said, guys, I've just watched this movie. I'd love to know what your ass man is. And so these two guys started to share with me what their ass man is. Like, what would be that thing that they would want to go after, that, the dream that's been placed in their heart? And I shared mine. And it was an amazing way to start a conversation. And I realized that God has given so many of us these things that lie latent inside because we just don't believe that we can achieve those things. Because we go for the tried and the tested. The path, the well-worn path. Not that that is wrong. But if God has called you to so much more than that, don't limit yourself. Because He's got such big things in store. So, that brings us to today's message. We're going to get into the Bible. Come on. The question I want to ask you is what wild and crazy adventure has God planted in your heart? What is it? You don't have to answer me. It's just something for you to think about. What is the race that God has marked out for you to run? It might be to actually do something physical and do a comrades as part of the adventure that God has you on. It might be that, but there's a spiritual dimension to it. There's a wild spiritual adventure guided by the Holy Spirit that God has for us to run. And then the last question, that one been challenging me, is what is holding you back from going on in? And that's what today's message is all about. So there's a physical component to this race. Please don't just leave here thinking that Dave said, I have to do an Ironman. Because that's not what I'm telling you to do. I'm the last person who's going to be signing up for an Ironman tomorrow. Um, maybe my wife will talk to me about that. But the way I feel now, I don't feel like an Ironman is right now what I want to do. But of course, there are things about a physical race that are carried over into the spiritual adventure that God has for us to run. As a physical race is grueling, so the spiritual race that God has for us is also grueling. And there are three passages that we're going to look at and three things that come out of Scripture that we can expect when it comes to the race that God has marked out for us to run. Let's call them similar features. Like the course that each of us might be on is different, likely, but there will be similar features for all of the races that God has called us to run. So, before we get into Scripture, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are a wild and adventurous God, that you are not a tame, meek, and mild God. But you call us to great and marvelous things. That Holy Spirit, you lead us beyond what we think we are capable of. Into an unknown and unfamiliar territory. Into an inheritance that we couldn't even dream of. And I pray that as we get into your word today, Lord, would you massage the truth of who we are. The truth of the things that you've called us to. Would you massage those things into our hearts today. In Jesus' name. Awesome. Amen. If you've got your Bibles here, the first passage that we're going to be looking at is Hebrews 12, and the first three verses, verses 1 to 3. It's a very well-known passage, uh, but we're going to get into it. There are three passages I'm going to read. I'll read those three passages, and then we'll get into the specifics of what I believe we can learn about the races that are ahead for us to run. So here we go. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3. Therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, let us strip off every unnecessary weight and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us, and let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. This is from the Amplified Bible. Just consider and meditate on him 
who endured from sinners such bitter hostility against himself. Consider it all in comparison to your trials, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 3. The second passage is 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 to 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. And this is Paul writing. It's one of those uncomfortable passages. And he says the following. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run their very best to win, but only one receives the prize? Run your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. Now every athlete who goes into training and competes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. Therefore, I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like one beating the air, like a shadow boxer. But I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I preach the gospel to others, I myself will not show, will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. Yo, that's Paul, on form. Then the last passage that we're going to read is 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 to 8. And this is, uh, many scholars believe, the final thing that Paul wrote before he was martyred in Rome. Uh, this was the last letter that he wrote. It was to Timothy, and this is what Paul writes in chapter 4, verse 7 to 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure from this world is at hand, and I will soon go free. I have fought the good and worthy fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, firmly guarding the gospel against error. In the future there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that great day. And not only to me, but to all those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. Awesome. So it's on the basis of those passages that we're going to talk about the race that God has marked out for us to run. And in case you think it's going to be a walk in the park, unfortunately, what we learn from Scripture is that it's not going to be that. It's going to be more than what we feel we have the capacity to endure. That God is going to call us to bigger things than we feel that we are capable of in ourselves. But that's a, that's a marvelous thing. If God just called us to what we were capable of within ourselves, then we would have no need of Him. But He calls us to things that are bigger. Far, far bigger. So here we go. Point number one. What do we know about this race? Well, we know that Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter of the race that we are running. It started with him and it finishes with him. The only reason we are running it is because he started it. The only reason we have any hope of completing it is because he has already completed it. We just get to follow in his slipstream. That's how I understand this race that we are running. And the, um, the Greek word for what I've translated their pioneer, some verses translated author of our faith, the word is archigos, it's the Greek word that means originator, like the, the first one, the founder, the one who started it all. And the word for race that's used in all three of these passages is, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's agon, A-G-O-N, that's the Greek word. And it's the root of agony, agonize, all of those nice words. So when they talk about this race, it's also been translated as contest, struggle, battle in the New Testament, this word. So when it talks about the race that we've been marked out or has been marked out for us, it's the battle that's been set for us to fight, the, the contest that we've been uh, given to take part in, the struggle that awaits us. It's not just this nice Saturday morning jog. For discovery points. It's a tough one. Paul uses the same word when he writes to Timothy in, in uh, chapter 4 that we just read when he talks about the good fight of faith. I finished the race. It's the same word. The struggle. And in the ancient world, these athletic contests were grueling. And even the toughest men, the toughest competitors, this was their thing. They competed in the arena. 
they would crumble under the pressure of these contests. So when they say that this is a battle or a struggle, this race is more intense, more demanding than what we feel we are capable of. Um, you think the comrades is intense. There's another thing called the Barkley Marathons. If you've ever looked up the Barkley Marathons, it's a hundred mile trail run, which is unmarked and it's insane. And it's non-stop. These people, like, they almost compete themselves to death. But it's, it's a grueling, grueling event. And that's something more like the race that God has marked out for us to run. That might sound a little bit heavy. But the only reason we have any hope on this race of faith is because Jesus has already completed it. Like if he hadn't completed it, we would have no hope of ever crossing the finish line. And this is the mystery to me of faith. Jesus calls us into this journey and he says, come with me. I've already finished it, but you can run it yourself as well. <laughs> but he's already finished it. The work is finished on the cross. One of the words he says, it is finished. But we get to join him in that race. And you read throughout the New Testament, it's such an honor. The, the, the disciples and the apostles counted it an honor to suffer in the name of Christ. To suffer as he had suffered. So Jesus, if we read in Hebrews 12, he embodied the ultimate struggle. Like his was the ultimate. From Gethsemane where sweating drops of blood through the cross, like his was the ultimate struggle. Abandoned, forsaken by the Father on the cross in that moment. There's no struggle that compares to that. Bearing the weight of the sin of the world. His battle was the ultimate. He endured the ultimate pain and shame that none of us now ever have to endure. And in Hebrews 12, if you look carefully, you would have seen this. He did it for the joy set before him. He did it for the joy set before him. What was that joy? Well, that joy was all of us. The cloud of witnesses who would be joining him in his victory. That's why he did it. It's like Jesus ran the race to open up the track for everyone else to run after him. Can you imagine the comrades could never happen? Let's imagine, thought experiment. There had to be one person who had to run it first before anybody else, could, before the race could be open to anyone else. And that's what Jesus has done. He's opened up this race to victory for all of us to follow. An amazing thing. That's the joy that was set before him. So we also don't run this race alone. As we run our race, we fix our eyes on Jesus. And not only Jesus, but we have this great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12 verse 1. And that's referring back to Hebrews 11. If you've read Hebrews 11, it's all of the people of faith who've gone before. It's everybody who carried the gospel before you and I were here. It's the people who've held on to truth, who've left a deposit on earth, whose prayers rise like incense before the Father in heaven. There's this picture and revelation of this massive bowl of incense where all the prayers of the saints throughout history are rising up before God. It's all of those people who've gone before us, this cloud of witnesses urging us on. And I want to be faithful in this time that I'm alive to run the race that God has marked out for me to run. And so if we don't start with Jesus, then all of this is going to be like rah, rah, like suck yourself up for this race. Who's tough enough to do this? No. Who's leaning into the strength of God enough to do this? Like who is the one who's led by the Holy Spirit? Because that is the one who can run the race that God has marked out for them to run. So the agonizing race of faith starts and ends with Jesus. Number two, the second thing that we learn is there is an imperishable prize secured for us at the finish line. I was looking into... Uh, the origin of the Olympic Games a while back. I was um, working my way through the Psalms, around about Psalm 8. Um, there's this passage where it talks about how uh, we are crowned with glory and honor. And I was wanting to understand what that looked like in the ancient world. Like, who were the people that were crowned with glory and honor? And some of the people who were crowned were the athletes at the Games, the Olympic Games, the ancient Olympic Games that took place in Olympia. And they would have these reeds of olive branches that they would win and Roman generals would also be given reeds made out of some kind of uh, wheat or uh, some other type of plant 
And all of those crowns, as valuable as they were in the society at that time, all of them would wither. Whatever you made, it would wither. And those crowns were the representation of what Paul is speaking about here. They compete in the games for a crown that withers. But you and I compete for an imperishable crown. And the only reason any of us has a crown that's got our name on it is because Jesus took on a crown of thorns. And there's this um, tradition that the, the thorns, they're called jujube thorns, the particular tree, these long, like, devil thorn looking things. Um, there's a tradition that um, when a general did something that rescued his army from certain defeat, the army would use whatever they could find on the battlefield, whatever plant they could find, and they would weave a crown out of that plant to give to the general as a recognition for the fact that he's rescued them from certain death. They called it the siege crown. It's also called the grass crown because it was made out of grass from the battlefield. And this is what was done at the time that Jesus was crucified. This was the tradition at that time. So you imagine these soldiers in an attempt to mock Jesus, are making him a crown of thorns that they can find right there on the battlefield. These thorns, they squish it on Jesus' head, not knowing that they're honoring him for rescuing people from certain death. It's like the siege crown that's being placed on Jesus' head. And he goes into the depths and he takes back the keys of sin and death. And with it, he picks up all the crowns that have our name on it. And these crowns are given to us Crowns of righteousness, with your name on it, with my name on it. The only reason we have any claim on any prize in this race is because Jesus picked up those prizes from the depths of hell and he brought them back to us. This is the imperishable prize. And if I claim any righteousness of my own, I have not understood what Jesus has done. The only reason I've got any prize in this race is because he's secured it for me at the finish line. And my job is just to run faithfully after him. <laughs> like I'm just going to run in the direction that you call me, Lord. And the prize is over there. And that's why Paul could write in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7. He could say, I, there's, a, there's a prize. There's a crown. An imperishable crown. I've poured my life out and I know it's there waiting for, my, for me with my name on it. So we are not the ones who are the victors. Christ is. Any crown we wear, we wear because of his victory. And one last thing in this section. Paul uses the phrase in Corinthians where he talks about runners run in such a way to lay hold of the prize. To seize the prize and make it yours. And it gets lost in English. Like, seize the prize and make it yours. It's cool. Yeah, go for it. But it's better translated as take with aggression. Like, Attack people for this prize. It's grasped in a forceful manner. Almost with some kind of like desperation. You're going after this prize. That's what the runners in these races would do. They would go to all kinds of lengths to win the race that they were competing in. And that's the language that Paul is using. Do whatever it takes to seize the prize and make it yours. To go after Christ. Do whatever it takes. To go after Christ and lay hold of the crown of righteousness he has for you. It's not a, no, let's wait and see how the race turns out. If I win, I win, you know. If I come second, I come second. <laughs> this is, no, I'm going to go after this thing with everything that I've got. Nothing's going to get between me and the crown that Jesus has won for me. One last verse here. Philippians 3 verse 14. Paul writes, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. And this prize is worth giving everything for. Paul spoke in, to, in 2 Timothy 4, he speaks about how his life was poured out, being poured out as a drink offering in pursuit of the prize that God had for him. The very last thing, number three, that this race requires perseverance. I was going back through um, Anders Hoffman's YouTube channel, and the, the very first thing he did, so 
he put this video out on YouTube that he is going to do the Iceman. And then his brother, who had a military background, older brother, said to him, okay, well, let's start putting you to the test. And this is in the middle of winter in Denmark, like snow everywhere. So he makes Anders get into a speedo and jump into the water and starts timing him. And he could only, like, he could only do something like 70 seconds in the water. Um, which wasn't enough, obviously, <laughs> to swim 3.8 kilometers in the ice water of Antarctica. And so every day he has to go back and he has to increase his time, increase his time, increase his time, increase his time, until eventually he's sitting for half an hour in ice baths, like up to the neck in ice. Now don't try this at home. But the lengths that he went to, to compete in this race, it was just staggering. You can watch the, the documentary. I mean, it is... The, the language that these guys use is not always great, but the story, if you, could, if you can look past that, and I wish YouTube had a way that you could mute it, but anyway, if you can look past all of that, like the, the commitment to his goal was just insane. Like even when he ran out of sponsors, when people were like, no, we're not actually going to sponsor you anymore. Like he ran out of money, he just carried on, he carried on, he carried on. And that to me speaks of the perseverance that's required for us to stick it out on this race that God has called us to. And I'll give you another example. There is, um, if you've watched in the news recently, um, an unraveling that's happening in the nation of Haiti, in near America. Like it's just, the nation is disintegrating. And being run by local gangs, competing with each other. Uh, law and order has just crumbled. And Still, this young missionary couple from the States, even though the American embassy was putting out alerts and warnings to, you've got to get out, they felt convinced from God they were not given the go-ahead to leave. And within a month, the young couple in the early 20s were killed. And you're like, God, I don't understand. This doesn't make sense to me. But... This is the, like, there are moments on this race that are, that will, for some people, demand their lives. And when you're out on the mission field, like, it is so easy to, to buy into the cultural lie that life should be easy. But the life of faith, there are times that it won't make sense, the decisions that God is calling you to make. And so now families back home, believing families who were praying for their son and their daughter who got killed, are, are now left to deal with this. Lord, how could this have happened? And this is not an isolated story. I mean, this happens around the world. I mean, it's, you, it's, it's incredible. I was doing some research a little while back. It's incredible how many people live in countries where they cannot express their faith freely, where the word of God is outlawed. Like, it's incredible. And that's still happening today. And in those places, God calls them to run a race. So it's easy for us to, to, to I, I'm very challenged standing here talking about the perseverance that's required to run the race that God has marked out for you. Because I don't actually understand what that requires. I'm just going from scripture and being challenged that Lord, there's, a, there's an endurance that's required here. There's a perseverance that's required here. And I need to, and I, I feel convicted to step up in myself. I'm not putting that on you. I'm just for myself. When I see what God sometimes puts people through, <laughs> I realize there's perseverance on this race that's required to stick it through to the end. And there's a prize. For those that, that young couple, there's a prize that is theirs. And it talks in Scripture about how the, the, the blood of martyrs, is the, it, it, it talks about how it rises up, it calls out to God. And those are the prayers that are in, in that bowl of incense that is described in Revelation that rise up to him, rise up to him. And there will be a moment where the angel takes the scepter and takes from those prayers and scatters it onto the earth. And, then, and you read in Revelation what happens, how powerful those prayers are when they are one day unleashed. I just, I'm sorry that it's heavy. This is the race that God has called for us to run. And I looked at, I watched Anders Hoffman and I thought, there is a guy, he's doing it for this random thing of running the Iron Man on Antarctica. And he's putting his body through the worst. Like he's just, it's the worst. 
Lord, may I do the same when it comes to the spiritual race that you've marked out for me to run. These are some of the things that Paul says. He says, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave. Whatever that looked like back then for him. And then in Hebrews 12, I'm not sure who wrote it. Let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us to run. There was this, uh, one more story. Carlos Alcaraz, if anybody enjoys tennis, I love tennis. Uh, Carlos Alcaraz on Friday afternoon at the French Open beats uh, Yannick Sinner who is also an amazing young tennis player. They played for, I don't know, over four hours, five set match, and Carlos was still smiling at the end, because he won. <laughs> and he was asked, like he just smiled through the match, and he was asked by the um, interview at the end, after this grueling win, he said, how do you keep smiling throughout the battle on court? And so this is Carlos Alcaraz's response. He says, you have to learn to find joy in the suffering. And this French crowd are like, yay. It's like muted, weird, confused applause. Because they're like, that's not a popular message. That's not, we were hoping you were going to give us like a cool tip. But no, you have to learn to find joy in the suffering. And this is one of my favorite verses on the topic. Colossians 1, verse 11 to 12 says, We pray that you'll have strength to stick it out over the long haul. Not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glorious strength that God gives. Now listen to this. It is the strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy, thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that He has for us. Wow. That's the message paraphrase. It just brings it out. And the word that's used there, the, the, the Greek word is kratos, when it talks about the strength that God gives us, like this earth-shaping power that God gives. That's the strength we need to get through on this race that he's marked out for us to, ra to, to run. It's called a gone for a reason. There's agony, there's anguish on this journey when God calls you to follow him. And only with his strength can you do it. Only because Jesus has already gone ahead of you can you do it. Only with the Holy Spirit leading you can you do it. Okay. Wow. So last, for, last passage I want to read is from a book called Run With The Horses. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it. It's a really, really good uh, little book about the story of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is complaining to God that life is hard. And God has called Jeremiah to be a prophet to the nations. And it's difficult. It's tough. And so Jeremiah is complaining to God. And God comes back with this. So this is... Um, a creative retelling of the conversation. It goes like this. Life is difficult, Jeremiah. Are you going to quit at the first wave of opposition? Are you going to retreat when you find that there is more to life than finding three meals a day and a dry place to sleep? Are you going to run home the minute you find that the mass of men and women are more interested in their own comfort than living at risk for the glory of God. Are you, Jeremiah, going to live cautiously or courageously? I've called you to live at your best, to pursue righteousness. Yes, it's easier to relax in the embracing arms of average. Easier, but not better. Easier, but not more significant. Easier, but not more fulfilling. I've called you to a life of purpose far beyond what you think yourself capable of living and promised you adequate strength to fulfill the destiny I have in mind for you. What is it that you really want, Jeremiah? Do you want to shuffle along with the crowd or run with the horses? It is understandable that you would want to retreat, to veer away from risk, to withdraw from faith. And he ends with this, Incredible sentence. It's easier to define oneself minimally and live securely within that definition than to be defined maximally by God and live adventurously in that reality. So let me ask you again, what is your ice man? What is my ice man? What is the crazy dream, the wild adventure that God has called you to run? What is it that the Holy Spirit has set ahead 
for you? What race has the Lord marked out for you to run? And again, I'm not suggesting that it is a physical race or a physical battle. There will be something that God has called you that draws on the spiritual gifts that He's placed in you. That draws on the various different abilities and giftings that He's placed inside you. And what is that? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you this uh, spiritual adventure that He wants to take you on. Because there's so much more that He has in store for us than what we generally are open to. So Lord, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge to live into the fullness of what you've created us to be. To live maximally as you see us. To live adventurously in that reality. And Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us the next step on this journey and the next step on this journey and the next step after that because there's so much more in store for us than what we generally accept than what we generally perceive and I thank you that Jesus you have gone ahead that you are the ultimate victor the one who has run this race to completion and we follow in your slipstream Lord there is a prize that you have won for us that's waiting at the finish line. And I thank you that that prize is secure. There's nothing that we can do to earn the righteousness that you've given us. But I pray that we would run faithfully after you all the days of our life, led by the Holy Spirit, into the fullness of the adventure that you have in store for us. Would you reveal to us the things that are holding us back? As in that passage in Hebrews, Lord, where it talks about us throwing off the things that entangle us, the things that hold us back, the things that distract us from the race that you've called us to run. Holy Spirit, would you reveal these things to us in Jesus' name? And we thank you for your power that is at work in our lives. For your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me quickly give you an update of our runners who are running the race that has been marked out for them by the organizers of the Comrades Marathon. And we have got as follows. So Mark has reached 35.3 kilometers and Margreta has just, just reached the 40k mark. So she's still going. Still going. Still going strong. So tune into the Comrades Marathon if you, if you can. Keep an eye out for our two River Church runners. Um, and when you get a chance to send them a message this evening, um, Mark, I'll tell you now, it is predicted, according to this prediction here, that he will finish at 4.12 p.m. So send him a message, 4.15. Um, <laughs> notice that uh, you'll be done by now. How are you feeling? All good? <laughs> and uh, Margreta is scheduled to come in just before three. Wow, one. So if she does finish, if she does run all the way to the finish line, um, that's, that's seriously impressive. Um, one last thing on this, the Grantly, the Grantly community, the, one of the dads has won the comrades three times. Um, I think it's Bungan and Tim, I think is his name. Um, he's won it three times. And so they had a group of boys, uh, mainly boarders, but all athletes, who decided they were going to run a kilometer each as a relay. So they did this, I think they did 85 or 87 kilometers, and they wanted to beat um, Sisanda's dad's best time. And they missed it by five minutes. Each of them running full tilt, one kilometer, and they couldn't, they couldn't beat his best time. Like that's just, to me, that's just insane. Anyway, so there's certain people that are gifted in certain ways, and we are gifted in other ways, and may the Lord use those for his glory. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone.